Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Creating Lightning, How Rise Visual Effects Brought Flash to Zeus's Bolt. First, I'd like to apologize for last week's technical difficulties. Sorry for any inconvenience, but we're very glad that you could make it to this rescheduled time. So for today's webinar, um, it will be presented by Berlin-based visual effects supervisor Florian Gellinger. After working for several years as a compositor, Florian's career was kickstarted at the age of 26 when he supervised the visual effects work on Oliver Twist by Academy Award winning director Roman Polanski. Two years later, in 2007, he founded RISE Visual Effects together with three friends in Berlin, Germany. And since then, RISE has grown to become the biggest visual effects facility in Germany's capital. They have space for up to 60 artists and just opened a second office in Cologne. His latest credits as VFX supervisor include Chris Columbus's Percy The Lightning Thief, which he'll be showing you today, and as well as James McTeen's Ninja Assassin and the critical love by director Matthias Glasner. Before I kick off the um, presentation to Flow, I wanted to go over a few um, different housekeeping items. and. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, after last week's technical problems, we decided to pre-record the session. So um, we have it, because of the length and because of the high quality of video, um, we have it, you may see a couple of brief pauses. Hopefully it will not impact your viewing too much. Um, the webinar will run for about 35 to 40 minutes, and Florian is live on the phone with us, so he'll be following along and we'll be able to answer any questions that you have at the end of the presentation. So if you think of anything throughout the webinar, please type it into the um, question and answer section, which is on the left of your screen. It says, Ch we'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but if we do not get to your question, we will try to email you after the webinar to follow up. At the end of the webinar, we will announce the lucky winners of the Nuke license, as well as two winners of um, Sapphire for Nuke plugins. So on behalf of GenArt, the Foundry, and Studio Daily, I will start the presentation. Hi everyone, and um, thanks to Kelly from GenArts and Lucy from the Foundry um, for the nice introduction and for letting me present some of our work on Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief by director Chris Columbus. Um, you might know Chris Columbus from uh, movies like the first two Harry Potter movies, for example, or Miss Doubtfire. Um, as the girls already said, my name is Florian Gellinger. I'm one of the owners, co-founders and visual effects supervisors at Rise Visual Effects. We're around since 2007 with offices in Berlin and Cologne, Germany. And since then, we've worked on more than 40 movies. For example, Ninja Assassin in 2008. And visual effects supervisor Chris Townsend called us again a year later because he saw what we can do in terms of lightning CG weaponry and flying cars and ninjas. Um, and he wanted some more lightning, but this time for Greek gods on Mount Olympus. Um, in the final scene of Percy Jackson, when the lightning bolt, the most powerful weapon in the world, is returned to Zeus. Um, in this particular shot that I will be covering today, um, you see that um, the design of the lightning bolt that was done by Digital Domain is pretty intense stuff. You can see when I crank down the exposure that there is tons of stuff going on inside it, that you have tons of super brights. Um, when you watch it um, playing back, you can see that um, all the individual little arcs that are sticking out of the lightning bolt have various animation speeds that they all behave differently. You have little arcs growing back into the main lightning bolt. You have little hair sticking out um, that uh, behave as if wind was blowing uh, into um, those little hairy arcs. Um, they have plenty of color variations. You have color variations from uh, bright, super bright white to cyan, to a darker blue, you have a photographic glow applied, um, you have a plasma moving inside the core, you have like a lightning backbone, 
um, wobbling inside it. You have chromatic aberration towards its uh, its edges. And then um, in this particular shot, because the bolt is so happy to be returned home to Zeus, you can see that um, it's completely freaking out, that it's blowing out the frame, um, that you have additional um, lightning arcs striking all through the frame and some flare elements. And um, so because Digital Domain was already busy for a couple of months designing the lightning bolt and they developed some proprietary tools to do it, um, we were called just three months prior to the final delivery deadline and we just didn't have the time uh, to develop our own software and we had to look at what's out there and what we could use to achieve the same look as they did um, only in less time. So because we made um, the lightning effects on Ninja Assassin already using the Sapphire tools, um, but that was like a, a much smaller construction site than than this one because the the lightning there was was really subtle and uh, not as apparent as as this stuff. Um, we we first had to test if we could make it work with out of the box software, and um, as you can see, it worked in the end, and we were very very happy. But it's not the only stuff that we did on Percy Jackson. We also did some uh, digital compositing environments using Nuke's 3D Space. Um, that's one of our core strengths at Rise, matte paintings and digital environments. Um, doing everything in comp rather than splitting it up over various departments and particle work and we do from set extensions to destruction stuff and digital pirate chips and crowd dubs. Well, everything you could imagine from, from a visual effects uh, company. Um, so um the 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 premise for for the lightning bolt was that it had to look absolutely cool but at the same time dangerous and because the kids were carrying around a prop uh bolt shape uh with some super bright LEDs inside that were uh, were giving them some interactive light while they were running around with a prop um it it had to look less than a prop and more like a natural phenomenon. It had to look organic and cool but dangerous. Um, there had to be... Um, we had to move it away from its static form of a prop and make it look like something that is in between something that you can't touch and feel and something that's actually there and that you can hold in your own hand. Um, so everything um, around this bolt um, the edges uh, had to wobble and we added chromatic aberration and other photographic effects like um, the glow and um, the plasma and everything and it turned out really really well but um, let me show you what else we did on Percy Jackson in addition to this shot so that you get a first impression of what we did at Rise. So we didn't just do um, lightning bolt effects as I said on, on Percy Jackson we did also digital environments like this one for example uh, where Percy and Annabeth are running towards the gods and everything around them is a digital environment solved using Nuke's 3D space uh, what uh, Percy is carrying in his hand is um, a prop lightning bolt and then we did the same treatment to it as we did to the CGI lightning bolts in the other shots um, so we wrote out the kids because they weren't um, small enough compared to the gods and um, Chris Columbus wanted them uh, shrunk down by 50% so we wrote them out and recreated the whole set from LiDAR scans and uh, textured it using UV maps and matte painting projections and then added some CGI fire and flickering light, contact shadows, etc. So that's basically it. And then um, this of course is the shot that I'm going to talk about today and um, there's a CGI lightning bolt with all the different effects like chromatic aberration. So in order to make this work efficiently we had to come up with a way with a workflow um, that we could apply to all of the 43 shots where we did lightning bolt um, effects. Um, without compromising the continuity of its colors uh, or uh, animation. So we had to come up with a basic setup that we could use for all of the shots. And um, this what you see here is just the setup for um, this particular shot. But some of the elements that I'm going to show you right now, like this one for example, was created by another artist in a sapphire um, 
comp that was just setting up the little arcs following closely um, the reference that we got from digital domain. As you can see, this is the tip for um, the bolt. Then here, this part represents the tail of the bolt. And right here, we have the little blue hairy arcs that stick out of its sides and curl a little bit as if they were little hairs blowing in the wind. And then you have bigger arcs on top of everything and of course bigger arcs that are uh, just jumping over um, and have little glints applied to them as lightning effects. So um, before we dive into this particular comp for this shot let me go uh, over to the basic setup that we used for all of the bolt shots to reference it for all the other shots. So this basic, uh, this is the base setup was used for all of the shots, and you can see already that it's very, very complex. It's using um, all those little sapphire zaps that you just saw, um, but it was the only way to make it work. Um, if you look at this, this is already so complex that if you would try um, to build this onto a scanned film background plate, then um, you could just watch a slideshow of frames rebuilding every uh, couple of seconds um, or minutes even. So um, you can see here that these are the individual little sapphire zaps that we use. Um, this is this is one that's pretty slow for example, slow moving little hair. Um, you can see that um, the wiggle speed is turned down to a minimum and that the jitter frames are um, set to zero, which means it, it doesn't have any jumpiness to it. It doesn't change its shape from from one frame to the next. It uh, basically just changes its, its, its shape very, very subtle and slowly. And um, if you look at this, what, what this does is this rotos out the, the root of this little hair uh, to give it a different color than its tip. Um, it's just blurring the um, the bezier that's rotating out its root, and then it's it's coloring the root uh, differently from its tip, and then key mixing everything back together. It looks when when you see that in um, the viewer, it looks something like this. This is the roto mat for um, its root. Then it's blurred and and mapped to the zap fall off red channel, and um, then we color, this is the root color, which had to be uh, of a s slight cyan, and um, then we create a fall off from this hotter cyan to a much cooler blue towards its tip, and mix both of them using the Bezier um, together so that you have a little arc that's really subtle in its movement and um, still has this hotness to its root and um, it's it's getting colder and colder towards its tip. Now when we go down, um, this is used to crumble the hair um, and to make it wobble like a little hair in the wind. So this is just distorting the shape. So this and is one, what you get once we've distorted um, it from those see, little hairs. This, the setup is basically doing the same thing all over and over again, um, just um, wobbling around and just look like little hair that's blowing in the wind. Um, in order to get that, we had our artists go out and stand in the wind, take off their shirt, and we shot mini DV footage of their chest and back hair to get a perfect motion reference. And um, I guess it proves if you if you just take nature as a, re as a reference then um, your work is going to look like a natural phenomenon. But this is not the only um, arc setup that the lightning bolt is made of. You see the, that was just the blue backdrop that we were covering right now. Let's look at the fill zaps that are filling up the gaps in between these little blue arcs that we just had a look at. Um, these fill zaps use a completely different approach um, to make them more versatile uh, where you could use them. Um, if you look at the, the sapphire zap settings here, 
you can see that their wiggle speed is pretty much the same as with the little blue arcs, but the jitter frames are set to 15. Um, that, had a, uh, that had a very specific reason, because we wanted to use the Zap plugin just once for these, and then um, give every individual one of them a time offset. What the jitter frames do is um, they tell the Sapphire plugin to, for example, in this case, if your jitter frames are set to 15, um, the arc will change its shape completely every 15 frames. If I turn this down to, for example, 0, you can see, or maybe 1, you can see that it's jumping around wildly because it's changing its shape completely now uh, when I set jitter frames to 2 every 2 frames. So this is a lot wilder and just by time offsetting uh, these little arcs uh, we could make them go absolutely crazy and make them more versatile in, and use them in all the areas where we didn't have little blue specific arcs um, yet on our lightning bolt. So, so resetting this to its original values and putting all of this together you get something that looks like this and these are, as I said, just filling in the gaps between those little blue arcs that stick out and these go back into the main bolt, um, just closing the bridge. The next arcs that we have are arcs that are actually um, varying in size. So we um, generated this wave pattern that's moving something like this. And another one that's moving like this that has a pulse to it so that you have like everything that has a pulse to it has more of an organic feel. And then if we add both of these patterns together um, and use that to again generate zaps as you can see right here and warp them using external noise then they get this nice pulsing animation on their surface as you can see here and merge them all together warp them a little more a little more wave distortion I guess you get the point um, I mean this is not something for um, biology class, um, we're not studying natural phenomenon, we're doing some effects animation, and these make up some parts of the core of uh, the lightning bolt, and also sometimes they tend to jump out, and they build these these arcs that jump over, and in but I'm not going too much into detail now um, to save on time because we still have to go back to our main setup to show you Zeus's face um, smiling happily because he, he has his bolt back. So yeah you can see same same thing to save on time and to save on, on CPU time um, we just generated one uh, arc uh, one zap in in this particular piece of of lightning setup, and time offset uh, it several times and transformed it to place in various different areas. So basically, this is like a box of Legos. Uh, you just put the arcs together to match the reference, add some wave distortion, um, and um, grid warp it, and then sharpen and crop it to save on on disk space, and you get something like this. And if you merge that with the rest that we already have, um, it's already getting a lot, lot bigger and a more, a lot more active. Um, next part, running zaps, whatever. Who came up with the name? I have no idea, but at least the setup is really, really tidy. Um, and those arcs right here, they just run up um, the bolt to its tip. Um, to give it some 
some some direction in its movement um, in addition to the pulse that it already has and you can see here that we uh, use distortion as well to um, give the little individual arcs some thickness variation that well it might look like a rodent that's uh, just captured underneath a carpet um, or inside a, a, a tube, a rubber tube um, but that's all the detail you need. You need the thickness variation, the color variation, the animation variation, and it all has to just um, look as if it was made out of the same plasma and had to match perfectly in style. This is the tip of the bolt. More zaps, more fall off areas, same as before, merged all together. Looks like this. Nice little tight bounding box around it compressed as EXR files, really fast to work with. And then again, one more for the tail. And in the end of this huge setup, we get something that we can pre-render and use for pretty much all of the shots or reference this setup into all of our shots to make adjustments. And uh, that's really, really fast to work with because as a starting point, um, this is really following the reference that we got very, very, very closely. Um, and this is really just the animation and the individual arcs for their placement. Everything that's going on with um, photographic glow and chromatic aberration is done in the main setup for a specific reason. Because, for example, most of the shots that Digital Domain did were against a very, very dark background. Uh, we in our sequence on Mount Olympus we're in a torch lit environment that has very warm background colors. You have the sandstone and marble and it's all illuminated by um, by torches and fires so you have very very warm colors and something that's purely blue or has cold colors doesn't necessarily fit into a well lit environment um, it's much easier to sell something in a dark environment as a light source if you're doing effects work or CGI you plug in some some glows that's really the the most difficult part in addition to the animation of the effects work um, your glow really has to look photographic you have to um, take photos of uh, for example um, light bulbs or LEDs or um, whatever you could ever imagine um, candles in, in an environment that's um, lit almost like the one that you're trying to integrate your effects in and pay close attention as so now that you know uh, what the individual little light uh, what the glow made is doing work it is um, to, uh, um, to make CMOS it work or CCD according set. to reference and to have all those different animation types um, we now dive back into our shot uh, where you can see that behind the window in the background um, We've got all sorts of thunderstorm stuff going on, um, but that is something that we pre-rendered in a different setup. I mean, you, you can you can probably guess um, what we use to do the lightning out there, and the volumetric light is pretty much just a directional blur on the alpha mat of our green screen key of the window. Um, so there's there's no fancy stuff there anywhere. There you go. Just some lightning in the background, some volumetric light shining down that's um, using the luminance values of the lightning outside of the window um, to control the color correction of the directional blurred alpha channel, the green screen key. So, um, but this is what we started with, well minus the window in the background, but as I said that's something you can easily imagine how we did that, it's not too hard to do. Um, now we're covering flicker on Rüstung, which means uh, flicker on armory. Uh, and doing that, we just did two quick roto shapes for his arm and his uh, armor and created some color corrections uh, on his armor um, as a reflection of the lightning bolt representing the same colors. And then the same thing head flicker light means we did the same um, to his face, rotoed um, his face and subtracted his hand 
and voila you get uh, the hint of blue in his face which is still very subtle but you don't want to overdo it and then you need something for him to catch which is this um, the lightning bolt itself was rendered out from Maya and animated in Maya and um, rendered out with a nice motion blur trail but this is just the standard 180 degrees shutter that you uh, get from from a normal film camera or 172 uh, degrees shutter um, so this lightning bolt was created uh, using a reference model that we got from the production they had a lidar or, or a cyber scan of the prop that the kids were carrying and then we textured it using uh, the film negative um, of the lightning bolt uh, or HDRs well in any case it was HDR footage with a higher dynamic range than just a digital still and if I crank down the exposure you can see the little LEDs inside we didn't do this because we liked the LEDs so much but we wanted to recreate the lightning bolt in this shot where it was entirely CGI um, to look exactly 100% the same as in all the other shots where the kids were carrying around the prop so we wanted to have uh, the same brightness values we wanted to have um, the exact same shape and color etc so um, we thought alright we might just as well um, treat the CGI object just like the the prop and give it the same texture and color values etc and uh, even include the LEDs in its core and then later um, just apply the same process that we applied to all the other shots uh, with the lightning bolt in order to make it look consistent and exactly the same so returning to its original exposure and going back to our setup This is somewhat where Zeus catches the bolt and you can see that we've already done something to the core we've already integrated um, the bolts inside the core with some uh, variation this is um, the setup part that deals with the core and then comps the whole thing inside right here and then some glow applied and some more plasma so here is where it all happens the, z the core and the zaps merge if I go back to normal exposure you see um, the nice glow fall off and there's plenty of stuff going on inside the core now so this is the first uh, basic treatment that the core gets um, then what we had to do in addition to that is um, warp it little bit more with some ripples that it looks organic uh, to get away from the static look that we didn't get from um, from the original prop nor the CGI obje object but as I said we wanted to apply the whole same treatment to it in order to make it look exactly the same and then this pulse thing what it does is um, again moving a radial um, up to the tip of um, the lightning bolt once in a while um, to have a bright light and a distortion moving through it. You can see the tip and the the glare that it has minus the rotoed out hand by Zeus and let's go over here real quick this is just a 2D transformation um, we exported the Chan file from the animation of the lightning bolt from Maya from the original lightning bolt animation that we used to render out the lightning bolt and then transformed the tip and the tail into a 2D transformation values in our compositing to do apply exactly the same transformations to all our little lightning arcs that we have from our reference base setup um, to match exactly uh, the position scale and rotation of our CGI lightning bolt so that was fairly easy just exporting the values in a chan file from Maya and then um, hit, uh, uh, typing that into or, or importing it into a transform node so 
Then here's some more stuff going on. I mean, I'm not going to cover this in, in real super duper detail because um, this is just some, some minor little uh, tiny zaps that uh, are individually hand animated to um, and then key mixing it with a constant background and um, distorting the original image plane uh, plate to um, distort its edges. If we look at this in close detail in the finished chart, you see that it's really, really subtle, but it's there and it starts warping all the little edges around Zeus um, that are geometrical objects, but it had to be really, really subtle. You, you're not supposed to see it in a still frame. It's, it's only to, to be seen uh, in motion. The chromatic aberration is basically just some uh, fractal noise that's um, merged with an edge detect of the bolt to separate some areas from others and then uh, we introduce some more um, red into hotter white well values so that you get the chromatic aberration on its edges where it's um, the hottest. Um, then in addition to that, if you look at this, I told you that the uh, that the glow is a very difficult thing to, thing to do because you need a couple of uh, different glows in order to make it work in the end. So here you see the final result of the glow. This is everything without glow. And then um, you add, we added a, a wide blue glow that illuminates the air all around it. Looks something like this. And then in addition to that, we added some more glow, like a, a white glow that's a little tighter around the core of the bolt. And then some more glow around just Zeus's hand to integrate his hand better uh, with the light that the um, lightning bolt is casting on him. And then there we had another idea. Towards the end we thought, wow, if this pure source of energy is flying through the air, wouldn't it be cool if it had like, like a trail while it's flying? Um, again, everything had to be done very, very subtle, but when we, you have something like, like this lightning bolt flying past the camera, blowing out the frame, uh, you want to do something like this trail down here, for example, in magenta, something that it, it fades off. So we rendered the same lightning bolt again from Mental Ray uh, using absolutely um, over-the-top values for, um, for the motion blur settings, which then looks something like this, more like a banana than, than the lightning bolt. And we, we used this um, just as a, as a mat for a color correction um, to add some heat distortion in the tail uh, of, of in, the, in the trail that's behind the bolt while it's in midair and um, some color correction to um, well add to the movement and the event of the most powerful weapon in the world returning to Mount Olympus. Okay, then we're just adding a little scan film grain. Another thing that's awesome in Nuke that you can just shoot uh, with any sort of film negative on a gray card. So now this card, setup and you can um, extract that takes grain the render and from the, the last setup that you just saw that integrates the lightning bolt in Zeus's hand and add some more wild arcs because this was a last minute wish by Chris Columbus. He said this is like the event where the lightning bolt returns home. Um, it has to be celebrated in some way and in what way could you celebrate a lightning bolt returning home better than adding more lightning? So uh, we went ahead and built more individual arcs, but this times uh, this time with with a uh, higher branchiness. If you look at this, um, it's it's a completely different setup the way um, uh, fr from the other arcs that you've seen so far. Um, they move pretty fast. They have jitter frames. Four means 
they change their shape uh, completely every four frames then the max distance it's is much much bigger than in the other setup and um, this time we're using not the standard zap but we're using a zap 2 which means you can pipe in an object in this case two radials right here and right there uh, and the lightning bolt will strike those two shapes that you can pipe in and um, tell the lightning bolt, the zap, how many surface points it should strike. For example, in this case, three. So we've, we've got three little branches hitting uh, both of those radials and then um, you set up the overall max distance, which is this orange little um, circle, uh, up to what distance the little branches and the lightning can strike objects that are piped in. So, and um, the rest is pretty straightforward. This is a mixture between zap twos, zap froms, zap whatever. Um, this is another one. Here's one more that's going more towards the camera. There is a tiny one, another one, and then we start adding um, some glow on top of it right there in nice vibrant blue and this is pretty much all the crazy arcs um, on top of the footage that you've already seen that we're just plugging in here there he is and now of course we need some more light interaction on his hand because um, the lightning uh, that we now animate wasn't there before in our last setup and once we plug all of this together um, we get something like this after a little while boom baby okay and um, and then what would be better to celebrate lightning arcs flying off of a lightning bolt than to add some lens flare and thanks to the sapphire lens flare kit uh, you can just do that instantaneously and use the lumens values as your source for the lens flare so that's really really straightforward convert the whole thing whoa alright sorry the gray cards missing so I guess the final shot be, with all the uh, different oh, elements that you just every saw once in a while added in a to webinar, it the way it um, is in the movie a little screw up. I want to thank Michael Dona, Dirk Matzkun and Christoph Hasche for their amazing work on our lightning bolt shots and of course Jonathan Weber who did a couple of lightning bolt shots as well uh, towards the end of the show and I'll be back for some Q&A later back to you Kelly and Lucy Great. Um, thank you, Florian. He was able to follow the video okay with the audio glitches, but other than that, um, so um, as I mentioned, if you have any questions on, type them into the chat Q and A, which is um, Florian. Are you on the phone? So I'm adding some questions to the queue. Um, just while he's dialing back in, I will um, send you some information going to be archiving the video so it was recorded on our site as well as the Foundry's website and Studio Daily's website so as soon as those are hosted um, we will send out an email that um, will contain if you have any questions about Gen Arts or the Foundry or the thank Studio Daily for helping us promote the webinar with their audience um, I'm always looking for feedback on how we can improve our webinar series, and um, you
link to the video for download. So yes, we will be um, recorded session um, on the daily site. And I'm going to try to put the video into three uh, in the three videos into one streamlined video. Get it uploaded into Connect. It was big of a file, so that's why we broke it up. As you can see, video, you know, high video. So uh, we had a little. Yes, we do have other webinars that are hosted on. Download this webinar. There, are, there's another new web webinar that we did uh, back with the Foundry and Studio Daily that um, a Nickelodeon show done by Artifact Studio. Questions are not coming up in the chat box. Um, as soon as Swari go through um, and handpicked as many as many questions as we can answer the questions live on the phone. Having trouble with his dial in number. If not, um, the good thing is I have an archive of all of these questions out to you individually to answer. Now, while we're waiting for him, why don't we announce the winners of the um, Nuke and Sapphire prizes? So um, we have, hey, Florian. Hey, how are you? Sorry for the delay. Hey, how are you? Sorry for the delay. Uh, I was just going to announce the winners of the um, licenses, and then we'll jump into a couple of questions if that's okay. All right, perfect. Okay. So the, we're giving away two Sapphire um, for Nuke plugin sets today. The first winner is Andres Kluge, K-L-U-G-E. And the second winner is Sabrina Ross. And I will be reaching out to both of you uh, with information on how to get those licenses set up for you. And as far as a, the Nuke giveaway, the winner is going to be Guy Paquin, P -A -Q U I N. So I'll make sure that somebody from the Foundry reaches out to you to to uh, get that figured out. So um, sorry for the delay on the Q and A, but we have Flo here, and everybody's lots of praises coming in for your presentation. So <laughs> <laughs> I know you worked very hard. Thank you. So I um, a question yeah. on how long <laughs> how long it took? How much time did you spend on the shots? Um, Questions like that. Um, well, we we started in I think early October um, last year, 2009, and it took us about two months to get the lightning bolt design just right, to get all the colors right, etc. Um, the the digital settings and digital environments were much more straightforward, as they just had to be approved as a work of concept art as a still, and then later on we just built the 3D version of it and uh, did all the camera projections of the matte paintings inside Nuke. So um, that was much more straightforward, but as always, uh, design work is 
difficult part, uh, especially when it's something as vague as FX design. So that took us about two months to get the, the first approval on our first lightning bolt that it looked just right and it integrated perfectly in the background. And then uh, we had another month to do the remaining 42 shots with the lightning bolt. And um, a question about why RISE chose Nuke over other packages. What advantage have you seen um, using Nuke um, to create these types of shots? Well, um, all of us, of, of the founders at RISE, we were always coming from a uh, compositor's background. And, um, um, well, I uh, and, and another founder, we had also a little um, background. But, of course, you need, for, for every show that you do, it doesn't matter if it involves CGI or, or not or matte painting, you always need a good compositing uh, application as a solid foundation for everything that you want to do. Because in the end, you have to compose all your 3D assets and renderings into your scene. Uh, you have to compose all your matte paintings into your scene and do all sorts of uh, removals or whatever you want. So um, we looked at everything that was out there in, in 2007, and Shake was just, um, well, uh, just hit its stride and uh, was no longer in development. So um, we actually just had uh, the choice between Digital Fusion. Um, that was already a um, little longer um, available commercially, but um, there were rumors that it was stable and they were still waiting for the next release. And uh, Nuke was already production proven by a digital domain and has um, all those cool features about how to customize it. And um, the Foundry did a great job during the last years to um, keep up the development and to implement some really sleek new features. And um, I just love the 3D space. I mean, it's so easy for, for someone who has a 3D background to do some adjustments on, on a full digital environment that you have inside your compositing application rather than uh, switching between applications. That's really very comfortable. And did you also use Nuke on Ninja Assassin? Yes, we did. Um, there was a lot of paint work, though, also. Um, and that's uh, we did the paint work uh, mostly with Autodesk Combustion and, and Silhouette. But, um, but everything else was, was Nuke compositing. Um, the CGI elements were comped using Nuke and um, some, some, some uh, camera projections of clean plates uh, with moving cameras were also comped using Nuke. So yeah, it's, it's just our primary compositing applications for everything we do on a daily basis. And um, I, I know you talked a little bit about how long it took you to build the shot, but how much went into pipeline and, and workflow research? To um, well, the, the our approach is usually when it comes down to doing something very specific in design, um, just to nail one shot and then just adapt the same setup all of the other shots. So we had really just um, the core team that was doing the lightning bolts, all three guys working on this um, reference design to get it right, to get the, the movement right and the colors. And um, so once they, they were done with that shot, um, we were uh, able to reference the setup and all the design features into all of the other shots were already prepared by that time uh, with keying, tracking, set extension, and everything else that needed to be done beforehand. Okay. And um, did you use anything in his hand as a reference, or did you make everything in CG? Um, you mean about the lighting bolt? Yes. Um, well, we, we did um, look at um, uh, lightning arcs jumping over, for example, on, on uh, electric uh, power lines. And, the way they look and the way they have uh, what sort of photographic glow and, and fall off uh, the glow has on, on real lightning. We um, looked at tons of images of uh, thunderstorm lightning striking. And of course, um, as I said during the webinar, we also uh, did look at um, a lot of different light sources, the way they behave in, in an equally lit environment, just the way the temple set did. Um, the camera tracker on Nuke? Um, 
On Percy Jackson, uh, we didn't have it uh, back there then because we're always a little bit behind in the version of Nuke that we uh, that we're using. Um, that's not because we're we're very mean and we don't like the foundry, but we always uh, try out the new stuff on on um, smaller projects and see if it works. Um, see how well it works on on our architecture and machines. Of course, we have to uh, port all of our in-house scripts and software first to the to the new Nuke version because it actually makes sense to use it. So we didn't use the tracker on Percy Jackson yet, but um, but later I did um, the Nuke master class in London, um, and we shot some stereo footage in Pinewood uh, in February this year, and then presented the result in April in London, and. Um, we did use the new camera tracker. It was um, at first it was a little tough to handle because at first it was a new um, it's it's a completely new camera tracker to deal with. And when you're used to other camera tracking applications, of course, it's always a steep learning curve um, to get to get it to work to do what you want it to do. And um, at the beginning, it wasn't absolutely 100% perfect. And in addition to that, it was even a stereo shoot where you had to solve two cameras at once and uh, two cameras at once that had to align perfectly in the end. Um, and um, so uh, the Foundry put a lot of uh, resources into de development because they had an actual project where they could watch if everything they did uh, with a camera tracker worked, and in the end, they developed a version that was working perfectly for um, for everything we did on um, on the stereo master class. And uh, since then, it has become even better. So um, I think in the near future, I'm going to try it out on on one of the next shows that we're doing. Okay. And um, do you have a keyer that you like the most, or do you choose different? Um, usually, we like to do uh, rough comps um, just to get a very good result quickly using key light. And um, but I uh, myself prefer the IBK keyer um, in the end because I still have the feeling that it gives you a lot of control over what you do. And um, but still, they they both have their reasons. And usually, you end up as um, with all big movie projects where you have tons of green screenshots, um, pretty much every compositor doesn't, doesn't just use one keyer at a time, but they uh, combine different keyers to get the best result. For example, key light to get hair and soft edges, and then the IVK keyer, for example, to uh, key the, the core of objects that are very opaque and uh, different colored from, from um, the background, from the green screen itself. So um, usually we tend to use a combination, but when you want to do something really fast, um, then we tend to use Keylight. OK. And um, was GenArt software, or how was GenArt software helpful in creating the digital environments that you had mentioned? Um, well, we uh, did use the, the RACD focus, for example. Uh, a couple of times because the um, you do need uh, for everything that has to do with light, um, for example, glows and and defocuses, they have to have a very photographic quality and they have to resemble something that you would actually get on a film negative or on a digital camera, um, and. Um, we did use the direct defocus, for example, because it creates very nicely blooming highlights and uh, is, is easy contro to control to, to the portion of the image that you want to uh, have defocused. And uh, of course, the, the glows were um, especially helps when you're dealing with CGI fire and you want to have a nice fall off from, from your film fire. And then you just want to have a very photographic glow quality around it um, so that it integrates better into the background. Do you have problems from the different color spaces footage? Can you say that again, please? Um, my connection was just a little. Did you have any problems from the different color spaces footage? No, absolutely not. No, no, no. Um, that's pretty much standard. We uh, work floating point, uh, linear color space um, for everything we do here. 
um, at, at RISE, and usually we get the, the scans delivered, um, just standard DPX uh, logarithmic space, um, and just convert them. And, and if necessary, we do a white balance first by offsetting the RGB channels. Um, but that's pretty much it. And then after we comp everything, just invert our white balance and send it out to our client so that he gets uh, just exactly the same scan plus the effect that we got um, to work on. And um, in the rescaled version, um, did you encounter any... Are you still there, Kelly? Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello? I think we may have um, lost Florian, but um, any of... Uh, you know, we, we're running low on time anyway, so uh, I will make sure that any questions that we did not get to, um, that either myself or someone at the Foundry or Florian will follow up with um, you. Uh, someone had asked if uh, Flo is going to be at IBC. Will be, so um, I think he'll be at the, the Foundry booth, actually. So, you know, swing on. And I hope that everyone... Um, uh, webinar and keep your eye out for an email from me archived versions of the webinar so um, if you have any questions contact me directly at kelly at genarts.com thank you very much for your time